Welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're uh, getting into something quite common but often misunderstood, gallstones. Or coelothesis, technically speaking. That's right. Our goal here is to really pull out the essential information from the clinical research, what they are, what can go wrong, how doctors figure it out, and importantly, what you can do about prevention. It's a really interesting area because, well, gallstones themselves are incredibly common, but how they present, it's almost paradoxical. Paradoxical how? We're talking about these little hardened deposits. Yeah. They form from digestive fluid right inside the gallbladder. Okay. And they can be tiny, like a, a grain of sand or a surprisingly large thing, golf ball size. That variation is huge. Wow. A golf ball. Okay. But you said paradoxical. Yeah. Here's the kicker. And this is really key. <laughs> Something like 70% of people walking around with gallstones, they have absolutely no problems. None at all. 70%. So they yeah. just sit there. Exactly. They can be completely benign, asymptomatic. The trouble only really starts when one of these stones moves and gets stuck. Ah, okay. Stuck where specifically? Usually in the tube leading out of the gallbladder that's the cystic duct or sometimes further down in the main pipe, the common bile duct that goes towards the intestine. Right. So it's not the stone itself. It's the blockage, right. the traffic jam, essentially. Precisely. Yeah. And the research points to a few key risk factors, things that make them more likely. It's uh, more common in women, in people carrying extra weight, and if it runs in your family. Okay. Women, weight, family history. Got it. And that really sets the stage for our whole discussion, doesn't it? Oh, God. Since most are silent, we need to understand when they stop being silent. And that usually means pain. That makes perfect sense. Let's dive right into those complications then, because telling these different kinds of pain apart sounds absolutely crucial for knowing what's going on. It really is. The first one you often hear about is biliary colic. Is that the starting point? Often, yes. Biliary colic is, well, think of it like the gallbladder having a sudden intense cramp or spasm. Um, it happens when a stone moves into that exit tube, the cystic duct, and causes a temporary blockage, intermittent. The pain is usually sharp, quite sudden and severe, typically felt in the upper right abdomen. Upper right. Can it spread? Yeah. Sometimes it radiates uh, around to the back or up towards the right shoulder blade. Pretty characteristic pain pattern, actually. You said temporary, though. Why only temporary? Good question. It's often because the stone might just shift position on its own or the duct spasming the colic actually manages to push the stone back into the gallbladder, clearing the blockage. Ah, uh, okay. So the pain stops. Right. The key thing about biliary colic is that the episodes usually resolve by themselves, maybe lasting, you know, between one and five hours. Mm. Painful, definitely. But it passes. But I guess what happens if that stone doesn't shift back? If the blockage stays? Well, that's when things get more serious. If that obstruction holds, we move from just colic into actual inflammation. And there are two main types to worry about there. Okay. What are they? First is cholecystitis. That's inflammation of the gallbladder itself. Right. If that cystic duct stays blocked, bile gets trapped inside the gallbladder, becomes stagnant, and irritates the gallbladder wall. This causes a much more persistent pain, one that doesn't just go away after a few hours. And other symptoms come with that? Yes. Typically fever, often nausea, sometimes vomiting. It's a sign the body's really reacting to that sustained irritation. Okay, so cholecystitis is gallbladder inflammation. What's the second type? The second and potentially more dangerous one involves the ducts further down. It's called cholangitis. Cholangitis. That sounds worse. It generally is. <laughs> this happens when the blockage is in the common bile duct, the main pipe draining the liver and gallbladder. But it's not just a blockage. The stagnant bile becomes infected with bacteria. Ah, an infection. Exactly. An infection within the bile duct system itself. Uh -huh. This needs urgent medical attention because that infection can spread quickly, sometimes into the bloodstream. The symptoms are intense pain, high fever, and often rigors those really severe, uncontrollable chills or shivers. Okay, that definitely sounds like an emergency. And this is where jaundice often comes in, right? That yellowing of the skin. Yeah. How does that fit with gallstones? Yeah, jaundice is a very visible sign. The mechanism is quite direct. If a gallstone completely blocks that common bile duct, bile can't flow into the intestine like it's supposed to. So it backs up. It backs up into the liver, and that the components of bile, especially the yellow pigment called bilirubin, spill over into the bloodstream. And that pigment circulating in the blood is what turns the skin and the whites of the eyes yellow. Precisely. It's interesting that jaundice itself usually isn't painful. That's a key diagnostic clue. But the bile salts that also build up in the blood can cause really troublesome, persistent itching all over the body. Itchiness. Okay. Any other signs with jaundice? 
Yeah, you might notice or the patient might report their urine turning a very dark color, like orange or brown. That's the kidneys trying to filter out all that excess bilirubin. These color changes are really important clues for the doctors. Absolutely. So moving towards how doctors figure this out, given that upper abdominal pain could be, I don't know, heartburn or lots of things, how do they actually zero in on gallstones? It sounds tricky. It can be. And that's why the patient's story, the history, is so incredibly important. It's step one. What are they listening for? They're looking for patterns, asking detailed questions about the pain. Where is it? How severe? How long does it last? Is there a fever? And crucially, is there any link between when the symptoms start and eating, particularly eating fatty foods? Ah, the fatty food connection. That makes sense. Definitely. They'll also ask about family history, as we mentioned, lifestyle, exercise, diet. Mm -hmm. And you brought this up earlier. They specifically ask about any recent rapid weight loss. Right, because that's a risk factor itself. Exactly. So after getting that whole story, they'll do a physical examination, feeling the abdomen, checking for tenderness. And there's a specific test they often do called Murphy's sign. Murphy sign, what's that? The doctor presses gently under the ribs on the right side where the gallbladder lives and asks you to take a deep breath in. Okay. If you suddenly stop breathing in because of sharp pain right at that moment, that's a positive Murphy sign. It's a pretty strong indicator of acute cholecystitis, that gallbladder inflammation we talked about. Huh. Simple but effective, it sounds like. So the history and the exam point them in the right direction, but they need to actually see the stones, right? Imaging. Correct. And the workhorse, the go-to test, is definitely the ultrasound scan. Like the ones used in pregnancy. Exactly like that. It uses sound waves. It's non-invasive, readily available, usually quick, and it's excellent for seeing stones inside the gallbladder itself. So it just shows the stones. It shows the stones. But experienced radiologists look for more. They look for those secondary signs we discussed. Like? Like if the gallbladder wall looks thickened or if there's a little bit of fluid around the gallbladder. These suggest it's not just stone sitting there, but active inflammation cholecystitis. Okay. But what if they suspect the stone isn't in the gallbladder, but stuck further down in the common bile duct? Or if the ultrasound isn't totally clear. That's when they might move to other tests. Sometimes a plain x-ray, maybe an MRI or CT scan can help. Mm. But often, if the suspicion of bile duct stone is high or things are unclear, they might go for something called an ERCP. ERCP, right, that sounds more involved. Endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. That's a mouthful. It is, but it's a powerful test. Endoscopic means they use a flexible camera, pass down through the mouth, stomach, into the first part of the intestine where the bile duct opens. Okay. Retrograde cholangiopancreatography basically means they inject a special dye backwards into the bile and pancreatic ducts and take x-rays. This lights up the whole duct system beautifully, letting them see exactly where any blockage is. And I remember reading that ERCP isn't just for looking, is it? That's the real advantage. It's diagnostic and therapeutic. If they find a stone stuck in the bile duct during the ERCP, they can often deal with it right then and there. They have tiny instruments they can pass through the endoscope. They might make a small cut to widen the duct opening, use a tiny basket or balloon to grab the stone, or just help it pass into the intestine. It's often the definitive test and treatment rolled into one when duct stones are the issue. Makes sense. And presumably blood tests are part of the picture too. Absolutely. They'll check liver function tests. Those enzymes will often be elevated if bile flow is blocked. And they'll look for signs of infection in the blood count, especially if they suspect cholangitis. Okay, so that whole process gives them a clear diagnosis, which brings us to the big question. What do you do about it? You said 70% of people are fine, so why not just leave everyone alone unless they have severe pain? Is waiting risky? That's a really central question in managing gallstones, and you're right. If you are genuinely asymptomatic, discovered, incidentally, the standard approach is active monitoring, just keeping an eye on things. Okay. And what if you just have that biliary colic, the temporary pain? If it's mild and only happens once in a blue moon, then just managing the pain with simple analgesics when it happens is often perfectly reasonable. That can potentially go on for a long time. There's a but coming, isn't there? There is. Once the pain becomes severe or frequent, or especially if you've had an episode of actual inflammation like cholecystitis, the recommendation almost always shifts towards surgery. Why the strong push for surgery then, instead of just managing each flare-up? It really comes down to risk. The risk of recurrence is very high. If you've had one bad episode, you're very likely to have another. And the next one could be worse, maybe leading to that dangerous cholangitis, 
or even a perforated gallbladder. Ah, okay. So it's about preventing future potentially life-threatening complications. Exactly. Removing the gallbladder, the source of the stones, removes the source of all those future potential problems. It's seen as the definitive solution once stones start causing significant trouble. And the standard surgery now is the keyhole approach, right? Laparoscopic cholecystectomy, no, 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 not call it. Yes. Lap coli is the common term. That's the gold standard. Minimally invasive, just a few small cuts. They use a camera, special instruments to remove the whole gallbladder. Recovery is usually much quicker than the old style open surgery. Are there times when they still have to do the big open operation? Yes, there are specific situations. The sources mention if the patient is in the last trimester of pregnancy, it's often safer to do open surgery. Also, if someone is extremely overweight or if their internal anatomy around the gallbladder is unusual or scarred from previous issues, making the keyhole view difficult or risky. Got it. So surgery is preferred, but what if someone really can't or won't have surgery? Are there any decent non-surgical options? Honestly, the options are pretty limited and often not very effective. There is medication pills you can take to try and dissolve the stones. Does that work? It only works on specific types of stones, mainly pure cholesterol stones, no calcium. And it takes a long time, like months or even years. Doesn't always work. The stones often come back when you stop the medication and it can have side effects. So it's rarely used. Okay, so meds are mostly out. What about diet? Can you fix it with food? Diet changes can definitely help ease symptoms, especially by reducing fat intake, which reduces how often the gallbladder needs to contract hard. But diet alone won't get rid of existing stones. It's symptom management, not a cure. Right. And what about that thing they do for kidney stones? Blasting them with sound waves. Lithotripsy. Lithotripsy. Yeah, it's used very successfully for kidney stones, but it's actually quite rarely used for gallstones. Why not? It's only really suitable for people with a single, relatively small, soft cholesterol stone and whose gallbladder is still functioning well. And even then, the fragments can still cause problems as they pass through the ducts. It's just not as reliable or widely applicable as it is for kidney stones. Surgery remains the mainstay. Okay, so let's pivot to prevention. This feels really relevant for people listening who might be worried about their risk. What are the big dietary don'ts? It really boils down to managing saturated fat because that directly influences the composition of your bile. The research gives a pretty clear list of things to cut right back on. Like what specifically? Things like meat pies, sausages, fatty cuts of meat, butter, ghee, lard, cream, hard cheeses. Also, commercial cakes and biscuits, which are often high in unhealthy fats, and foods made with lots of coconut or palm oil. So basically limit the rich, fatty stuff. Makes sense. Pretty much. A balanced diet, lower in saturated fat, higher in fiber, fruits and vegetables, is generally protective. And we keep coming back to weight. You mentioned rapid weight loss being a risk. Can we just underline that again? It seems so counterintuitive. It really does, but this is probably one of the most critical prevention messages, especially if you are carrying extra weight and thinking about losing it. So what's the advice? The key is gradual weight loss. Mm. Aim for slow and steady. Why? Because very low calorie diets crash diets that cause rapid weight loss. They significantly mess with your biochemistry. They can lead to the bile becoming super concentrated with cholesterol relative to bile salts, and that dramatically increases the risk of forming new cholesterol gallstones. So paradoxically, trying to lose weight too quickly can actually cause gallstones. Wow. Slow and steady wins the race, literally protecting your gallbladder. Absolutely. That's a vital piece of actionable advice. Any other lifestyle things? Does alcohol play a role? Interestingly, yes. Some of the research reviewed suggests that drinking small, uh, moderate amounts of alcohol might actually help reduce the risk slightly, though obviously that needs to be balanced against other health advice regarding alcohol. Right, moderation being the key word there. Okay, so let's try and wrap this up. What are the absolute must-know points for you listening? Well, I think first is understanding those main risk factors. Being female, overweight, and family history definitely increase your odds. Okay, and second? Knowing the difference between that temporary pain biliary colic and the more serious persistent pain with fever that suggests inflammation like cholecystitis or cholangitis, that difference is really important for seeking timely help. Makes sense. And finally, on the prevention side. Watch the saturated fats, yes. But critically, if you need to lose weight, do it gradually. Avoid those crash diets. They are a specific risk factor for triggering gallstone formation. Slow and steady is the way. Great summary.
So we started this by saying, what, 70% of people with gallstones have no symptoms at all. They're silent. That's right. The vast majority. Yet when symptoms do occur, the go-to definitive treatment is usually to just remove the entire gallbladder surgically. Correct. The lap collie is the standard. Which leaves us with a really interesting final thought, doesn't it? Given how common these silent stones are and that the main fix is removal, what does that tell us about how essential the gallbladder actually is for long-term health in modern humans, even when it seems to be working okay on the surface? It certainly makes you wonder about its role, doesn't it? Especially when so many people live perfectly healthy lives without one after surgery. Something for you to think about.